Welcome to I Wanna Mute Talk. Uh, as you know, this is a series of events that are sponsored by NTNU in collaboration with the University of Oslo and with the help of amazing students and teachers from the MCT program, Master in Music, Communication and Technology. And so how it works, we have audience here in Trondheim. Hello, Trondheim. <laughs> we also have audience in Oslo. Hello, Oslo. <laughs> And we also have online viewers. Hello, online viewers. Uh, come here. <laughs> cool. So how it's going to work, we, um, I'll introduce the speaker today. We will have 45 minutes of uh, 50 of uh, talk and then 10 minutes for questions. It is my pleasure to present our speaker today, Solvi Istat. Solvi Istat has a degree in civil engineering in electronics from Norges Tekniske Oskule in Trondheim, Norway. In 1998, she received a joint PhD degree named European PhD Thesis from NTNU and from the University of X Marcel uh, to Marcel. She has been a postdoc at the University of, of Stanford in Karma. Uh, and in 2002, 2002, she obtained a researcher position at the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique in Marseille. She was the coordinator of the Sensons project during four years. In 2017, she co-founded the Interdisciplinary Art Science Laboratory PRISM, PRISM, that stands for Perception, Representations, Image, Sound, Music in Marseille. Uh, she also co-founded the master program Acoustics and Musicology, created in 2018 at the X Marseille University. And in October 2019, uh, this past month, she co-chaired the International Art Science Conference Computer Music Multidisciplinary Research, which has been a great success. So please, let's give a round of applause to Solvi Istat. Thank you very much, Anna, for introducing me. And sorry for my voice. It's, um, it's not a party voice, but it's a, a, a true uh, cold. Yeah. So uh, I'm very happy to be here today. And it's, uh, it's also very nice to be back and uh, to see even some, not old teacher, but some previous teacher, let's say, uh, Jan and... <laughs> So it's, uh, it's very nice for me to be here to talk about what I'm doing now and what I've been doing since I left uh, Trondheim. So uh, before I, I uh, talk about my research activities, I'll just maybe say a couple of words of this new laboratory that we created in uh, 2017. Uh, so it's called PRISM, Perception, Representations, Image, Sound and Music. And the idea is here to uh, really have a very, very interdisciplinary a view on uh, three uh, objects of research, so it's image, sound and music. And what we do is that, what the idea is that uh, uh, people can come from any research field, we kind of want to break down the barriers between different research fields and encourage uh, uh, kind of collaborations between uh, both uh, formal science, human science and also artistic practices. So uh, the uh, laboratory is structured around three axes. One axis is perceptual engineering, that's mainly what I'm uh, doing. And uh, there's another act, uh, axis that is more uh, focused on creative practice and artistic exploration. And then the third axis, uh, which is more like applications linked to uh, so, yeah, social application, industrial and medical. And so as you see uh, down uh, uh, below here, you see a lot of um, uh, research um, domains and, and these are really a research in mind that are for the time being part of uh, the laboratory. So we have uh, acousticians as myself, and uh, we also have uh, uh, people who are specialized in, in neuroscience. We have um, medical doctors, uh, psychiatrists. We have uh, musicologists who are specialized in uh, a more like music history. Uh, and um, uh, we have um, a researcher or, or um, uh, uh, artist, uh, a sound artist from uh, the, ex, uh, the um, art school in X, and we have also people working with aesthetic sociology and also some uh, philosophy. And so um, the idea is here now to to um, to make all this work. It's not easy because uh, uh, we don't have a tradition of working with uh, people from uh, human science and artists, but we think that it's really important to uh, not to always be with the same people and people who uh, who have the same training and background as yourself. And I think uh, sound and music especially is very, very well adapted to this kind of uh, interaction between different uh, um, cultures. Uh, 
we also created a master program to favor this communication or this collaboration between uh, uh, acousticians in particular and the musicologists. And so this is maybe a master program that might interest also some, uh, some students here in Norway. Uh, unfortunately, it's all in French, but uh, uh, maybe we could think of some kind of uh, exchange programs or uh, at least for um, a project um, uh, work. So uh, there are two specialities, engineering and sound conception and the musicology and creation. So uh, the people who are in the engineering speciality, they come from uh, physics, mathematics, uh, computer science and so on. And, um, and uh, the other uh, uh, speciality is uh, more like uh, adapted for people who are composers, uh, musicians and so on. So uh, we have a great challenge as, as teachers to, uh, to try to, uh, to create a common uh, uh, program because the first year, uh, they do. They have a lot of teaching together. So uh, the idea is that uh, the musicologists learn more about technology, and also that uh, our engineers uh, are more uh, become more like uh, uh, sensitive sensitive to uh, uh, aesthetics and um, music and so on. And um, so, uh, well, uh, uh, there are, there is more information uh, down at this, the the screen here. And so, if you're interested, you can go also log into the the web page which is in French, unfortunately. <laughs> but if you, you know, if you have questions, you can also contact me. Uh, so let's get back to uh, um, the scientific presentation. So uh, what I'm, I said I was working on is mainly perceptual engineering. So what the, the main questions that we ask ourselves are like, uh, how, do you, how do we perceive sounds? And uh, it's not only musical sounds, but sounds that uh, like uh, environmental sounds as well. And what do we actually pay attention to? And uh, how can we use new technologies to understand human perception and to develop tools for sound design, industry and remediation? Because this term, perceptual engineering, it's kind of uh, a bit intriguing because uh, engineering is very, very like technology-oriented technology and perceptual is more like uh, psychology. But I think it's a, very, uh, it's a term that very well um, uh, describes what we are doing. So, uh, well, we'll see uh, after the talk if you're, you agree with that or not. Yeah. So I'll, I'll uh, rapidly talk about three main topics. So uh, first, uh, I will present what we've done on isolated sounds, and then um, uh, how we now try to include the 3D space and what, how sounds are perceived when they are like, uh, uh, correlated with a specific space. And uh, also, how do we perceive sounds in presence with, of other moda modality? How, how is sound perceived, for instance, in the presence of uh, vision? Uh, in the presence of uh, movement also, when you're moving, uh, uh, how do, do you perceive sound? And also uh, when you have some kind of haptic interaction. Uh, so uh, let's start with a short sound quiz. Uh, I often start with this sound quiz because uh, to show people that they are actually, exp everybody is expert, expert in uh, sound perception. So uh, if you could tell me what, what you hear here, let's see, oh, sorry. Uh, it's a bit too slow here. Um. So, did you hear some waves, some wind, maybe? Yeah, it was not too too complicated. And uh, and then some water, maybe. <laughs> You're shy. <laughs> I was I was shy as well when I was here <laughs> last time. This one. <laughs> Not too hard? I don't know if this one was French or Norwegian. <laughs> so uh, this is just to show you that um, we're all experts in recognizing sound. It's really easy. It's, uh, it's, it's nothing. But uh, when you are supposed to uh, explain to a machine how, how a sound can be recognized or how sound sources can be separated, it's something else. It's really more, more difficult. Uh, we only have two uh, eardrums, and uh, from these tiny vibrations, we are able to, to know uh, 
interpret in incredible things. Uh, I have some other sound examples that are a bit more difficult to, to describe, maybe. This is more intriguing and um, maybe because uh, it's more difficult to describe this one. Some, some kind of string-like thing. So these are more like uh, acousmatic sounds. This sounds like a suffering animal or something in a cave or something, don't you think so? Yeah. And so mm, this is just to illustrate that, well, um, there are uh, many types, many ways of listening to sounds. And uh, Gaver says that there are two, two main ways of listening to sound. You probably have heard about these in courses and everything. Everyday uh, listening and musical listening. And uh, so uh, we generally tend to try to find the cause, what, 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 what made the sound, the source, you know, what was the so source behind this sound. And um, this is the most natural way of listening because I think it's a matter of survival. We need to know, you know, the, uh, if there's a danger or not, uh, if something is approaching, if it's a big thing, a small thing and so on. And, uh, but there is also this analytical, this analytic listening, uh, that, which more focus on intrinsic properties of the sound. And, and this kind of listening is interesting for us as uh, engineers because it tells us a lot about what we should look for in the signal uh, to try to understand why a sound evokes a specific, a specific uh, situation. And so Smalley talks about source bonding as well as a natural tendency to relate sounds to supposed sources and causes. I guess you've had this in, in you've heard about this already, I guess, in the, in the study. And then there is... Um, Schaeffer, who talks, who introduced a term reduced listening with his um, music concrete, uh, concrete music that uh, where uh, you favor ac acousmatic listening, and, and this is also something that is uh, interesting for us when we work on on sounds and and, uh, and structure because uh, if we c manage to force our uh, subject to to have a more like this uh, acousmatic listening approach, then we get more out of them more uh, indicators. To, for, to, to know what for look, to look for in the signal. So what we do um, uh, to understand how we perceive sound is that we use a lot of listening tests. So it's uh, inspired by uh, uh, like experimental psychology. So there are several, this is just, um, uh, it's not an exhaustive list, but uh, we can use uh, categorization tasks, for instance, where we ask people to categorize sounds in one, two, three categories, or free categorizations where subjects, they choose themselves uh, how many categories they want to create. And you can also have absolute ratings. You just ask people if uh, the sound is uh, good quality, uh, uh, natural, uh, uh, familiar, and so on. And uh, dissimilarity ratings, that is all very often used in timbre studies to uh, explain the perceptual distance between different sounds. And then you have also psycho uh, psycholinguistic analysis of uh, spontaneous verbalizations where you, this has been done, uh, for instance, uh, uh, on musicians. Uh, you, they, they play on a specific violin and uh, they're supposed to tell, to use their own words to describe the, the, the perception and the way they felt uh, 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 the, the playing of, the, uh, of that particular instrument, for instance. And then you also have some vocal imitation uh, examples where you ask people to imitate uh, sound. That's quite funny. I have some examples. And also some uh, elicitation interviews where you uh, ask a person to listen to a, a sound, for instance, for a brief instant. And then there is an, an interview for uh, almost an hour about all the evocations linked to uh, what uh, the person perceived and so on. And, and uh, that is something that is also used by the, the doctors who are in, uh, in our uh, lab because uh, it also is used to, for therapy to help people relive uh, previous experience uh, that uh, have caused problems in their lives and so on. So the first example uh, is, I, I very much like this example, so I've showed it very many times because um, uh, we, had, uh, we were contacted by Peugeot Citroën and uh, they were very curious to know uh, more about the, the car door sounds because they discovered that the clients, uh, when they were to buy a car, they often slammed the door several times and they actually discovered that this had an influence on the sales, this, this tiny little sound. And uh, I'll, I'll let you hear the sound because it's, it's really, uh, it's, it doesn't sound uh, significant at all. This is one example, and this is the other. 
So you see, it's, it's very, very short. It's uh, only 250 milliseconds. And this little sound can, can, can completely change your impression of the quality and the solidity of the car. It's amazing. So sound is uh, magic, really. And uh, so the, the aim here was to try to find out which structures in the signal that were responsible for the evocation of car quality. And so we uh, had several questions. So for instance, um, uh, how do listeners attribute meaning to such a short signal? And uh, what do the listeners actually perceive in this signal? And uh, would it be possible to predict sound quality ratings from signal morphologies? So could, would it be possible to give uh, this signal to a machine and the machine would predict whether the car would be, of, be perceived as good quality or bad quality car? And so we did a lot of listening tests and uh, as I said previously, uh, there are two main ways of listening to sounds. And so um, uh, either uh, you uh, focus on the source that produces sound or on the intrinsic uh, sound properties. So in the first case, uh, we asked uh, um, naive listeners to ev evaluate 26 sounds uh, based on the quality, uh, solidity, closure energy and door weight. And in addition, we had uh, experts on uh, door manufacturing from PSA who also evaluated the same sound, but according to their own criteria, because they had very precise ways of describing the, so the, the, the door, like uh, linked to the lock mechanism, vibration, joint noise, and so on. And what we discovered was that uh, there was a mutual agreement. So all the, the, the subjects, they, they, they judged uh, the, the cars or the sounds in a similar way. So uh, we found out that there, there, there was hope. And, and then uh, what we, but this didn't really tell us a lot about where to, what to look for in the signal. The signal that you see on the right hand side is very small, very, very, very dense. And there is a superposition of sources in this signal. So, so it's quite a quite complex uh, task. And so we did something called uh, sensory analysis. And this consists in uh, inviting uh, naive persons uh, to work on um, sound descriptions uh, for um, several weeks, actually. And so uh, they had to listen to the sound and come up with the, some descriptors that, uh, from their own language. So it could be onomatopoeia or, uh, or their own words. And, uh, and so um, they came up with uh, uh, sounds, uh, words like ka, boom, intense, some uh, stuff like this, you know. And, and, and so this actually tell, told us a bit more about uh, what to look for, because there was something impulsive in, in what they descri described. And so uh, uh, they, they d we did the same there. Uh, they, they were also to evaluate the 26 sounds according to their own descriptors. That they, they had, there was a mutual agreement on these three main descriptors. And so we found out that uh, what was important was the presence of high and low frequency impacts. And so what was nice was that we could really draw a link between the analytic listening in this boom, que, and tense, uh, up to the ecological listening, which was related to the doorway, the energy of closure, which was more like the causal listening, and up to the solidity and quality of the sound car. And, and so uh, what we uh, finally, the, the conclusion of it all was that a, a car door sound should contain four impacts. So there should be three short impacts with a specific time delay between each impact because you need these three impacts to feel that the, the car is really close, that the, the lock mechanism has worked well. And then you need a more low frequency uh, impact that tells you that the, the door is, that the car is solid, you know, so it has to be kind of uh, uh, slowly damped. It has to last for, for a certain time, otherwise uh, you don't feel that the, the, this is good quality uh, uh, car. So this is something that is used now by the engineers in PSA, and uh, they don't add sound to the, the door, but they uh, adjust the mechanics of the door so that it gives the right sound. You, you, you will listen next time you, you drive a Peugeot or a Citroën, uh, if, it's, if it works. So there are other, um, as I said, other methods to, uh, to, do, um, to try to find these uh, structures in the sound. So uh, some years ago, um, we did uh, also with Peugeot Citroën some um, studies on the uh, uh, the motor noise, the acceleration. Why is it that some uh, cars sound more sporty than others? And so uh, uh, we asked some 
some uh, uh, subject to do some uh, vocal imitations here as well. So I don't know if this is a real sound or mm -hmm. this is a vocal imitation. So this was supposed to be a sporty car. So what we discovered was that it has to go from un to un. Uh, if it's no, there's no un, then it's not sporty. Yeah. So uh, this was quite uh, amazing. And then uh, uh, currently there is a student of ours who, who is going to um, uh, defend his uh, PhD this month. And uh, he has done some other um, imitation on uh, some synthesis sounds that you will hear here. So people hear this sound, and then they should imitate it. And there's another one with water. This is really particular, and it's uh, quite interesting to hear the imitation. <laughs> yeah. So, so, the, but it, it's quite uh, efficient because then you you also can, uh, you know, find out whether uh, what are the main structures that the person has paid attention to in the signal. And so, uh, be, since I was talking about synthesis now, I'm uh, going to um, explain a bit how we use sound modeling and sound synthesis to uh, uh, understand human perception. So. Uh, you might be familiar with this analysis synthesis uh, approach. Uh, the idea is to start uh, by a natural sound and uh, you, that you record and analyze. And uh, then you can extract some parameters from the analysis. And with uh, some synthesis algorithm, you can reconstruct the synthetic sound from a reference sound. That is not exactly the same as a natural sound, but it's perceptually identical. Uh, that's enough. Um, so uh, we have been doing that this for quite a long time, and uh, uh, you probably have heard a lot of examples of uh, sound synthesis. So I'm just going to play one example of uh, additive synthesis of violin sounds, where you have uh, you add components uh, until you get uh, the uh, original sound. And then uh, uh, an example from my PhD uh, thesis where I did some uh, cross synthesis. So this is the idea is to use um, a, a flute uh, source and to uh, uh, replace the, the resonator by a, a string. So it's a bit uh, the effect that you would have if you could blow into a string. And so since then we've uh, done some uh, quite a lot of uh, um, synthesis on uh, environmental s uh, sounds. So this is stones. And of course, you can do illusions like uh, Jean-Claude Risset did a long time ago with this sound that never ending uh, sound that goes down and down and down. That I guess. So, um, so this is just to show that uh, with sound synthesis we can do, do a lot of things now and make really realistic sounds. So that is not the main challenge now. The, the challenge is more like uh, how to control the sounds because when you have some synthesis algorithm like synthesis, uh, additive synthesis of piano sound, for instance, is like several hundreds of parameters that you have to control if you want to play with it. So that's the, the big issue. And also uh, another question is how uh, do we... Um, uh, create a sound if we don't have any reference. If somebody says, for instance, I would like a sound uh, of a rolling ball uh, on a specific, uh, on some specific tiles or, uh, uh, or some uh, sounds that uh, don't really exist but can, could exist in a virtual world like a, a rolling orchestra or a bouncing clarinet, for instance, how could I do this? And when you don't have any reference, then you have to start to uh, understand even more how we perceive things. So that's why uh, 
uh, we had this uh, research pro uh, project uh, several years ago. We started to work with people who were specialized in uh, cognitive neuroscience. And the idea was to use this analysis synthesis approach <coughs> to, um, and combine it with um, uh, experimental psychology uh, um, experiences and also um, uh, some brain image imaging. So uh, the heart of the project was really to understand what uh, is the, the, um, the message, the sense of sounds. And <coughs> so what we, uh, what we um, uh, our hypothesis in our approach is that there are some uh, common perceptually meaningful sound structures in sound. So if, for instance, you listen to this, two sounds that are maybe very, uh, they're not very equalized in so Sony, so... And, and in, in loudness, so that's my fault. So if it's a bit strong. <laughs> so could you recognize these, uh, these two sounds? Well, did, did, did they evoke anything for you? Yeah? The metal, yeah? So the structure is, uh, the, the object is um, obviously metallic, but the action is different. In the, first, in the first part, it's hitting. And in the second part, it's scraping. So we very easily <coughs> recognize the object that has been um, at least the material and also the action. So uh, therefore, we, we uh, based our hypothesis on uh, uh, Gibson's ecolog uh, ecological approach to perception that he made for vision that there are some invariant sound structures that are responsible for the uh, recognition of events evoked by sounds. So there are two kinds of, uh, for the time being, that's what we use, two kinds of uh, invariants, transformational invariants that tell you what kind of action was uh, used to make the sound, and, transform uh, and structural environment, uh, invariants that are responsible for the recognition of the object that made the sound. And so if uh, we can find these uh, invariants and we're able to identify them, then uh, an intuitive sound control should be possible. So this is what we've been looking for uh, since that project, actually. So just to illus illustrate uh, why it is useful to, to, to uh, have these um, invariants. Uh, some years ago, we did some uh, recordings of a, a, a semen blender. Uh, you can see here, there's even a small rabbit under the, the blender, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but if we know uh, the uh, invariant that we should apply to make this uh, um, sound more lively, we could, for instance, uh, simulate a cement blender that passes in front of you in 40 kilometers an hour. So, uh, this is what we try to do here. <laughs> so, you know, it uh, can't be kind of nice to, to, uh, to manipulate uh, human perception. And um, so, uh, as I said, we did some, um, also uh, a project uh, with uh, brain imaging techniques. Uh, here, the idea was to identify um, or understand why we're able to distinguish glass from wood from metal. Uh, what are the ingredients that are necessary to, to evoke these kind of, uh, of uh, materials? So what we did was that we uh, um, used, uh, we combined sound synthesis and brain imaging techniques. So the guy you see on the picture here is Snurre Farner. He's a Norwegian who also went to Glösagen to Enteho at that time. And he came uh, for some years uh, in, uh, to do his uh, postdoc in Marseille. So he was mi badly mistreated. So, uh, but he looks happy on the, on the picture. And so, um, so we, we recorded um, specific typical sound from wood, metal and glass. And then we did some morphing interpolation between the different sound categories. So uh, just to show you one, to, to let you hear one uh, example of the morphing. You can hear here from wood to metal.
So all these sounds were mixed together, and then uh, the subjects were asked to uh, categorize them in one of the three categories, wood, metal, or glass. And, um, and what we found was that uh, uh, there were, uh, we tried to find the cor correlations. First of all, uh, concerning the brain imaging uh, result, we saw that uh, 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 People tend to, it's, it's not easy to see for you, but uh, uh, you have to trust me. Uh, the, the results show that uh, uh, people uh, recognize metallic sounds more quickly than the other categories. Maybe we're more used to listening to, to metal than the other uh, sounds, I don't know. And uh, also there were two main uh, timbre descriptors that were uh, essential for recognizing material. It was the damping, the way uh, the, the sound is, is uh, ev uh, or, uh, yeah, and the roughness. Um, and, and so uh, what we were able to do was that we, we, we created a perceptual timbre space of materials. And so, sorry, it's in French, but uh, it's glass in green, then uh, wood in, um, in um, uh, brown and uh, metal in gray. And so what is very interesting with this uh, material space where the distances are perceptual, uh, uh, it depends. You can see that it depends on the um, well, uh, it depends on the roughness and the um, and and the damping. And what is interesting is that uh, thanks to this space, uh, actually, we can understand how we can transform a glass sound into a metal sound. For instance, we need to increase the roughness and also modify the damping. And uh, also, how to go from a metal sound to a wooden sound? Then you have to decrease. Then the, the damping has to be stronger for wood than for metal. So this made it possible for us to to uh, create uh, an intuitive synthesizer with um, uh, on the left hand side a material space. So now we approach what I said in the beginning. What if we just imagine an object that makes sounds? How can we make it possible for people to control? Uh, uh, the sounds very easily. And so uh, in the material space, you can see there are five different categories. And then there is a shape space also. So you can act on the ch shape of the object that you imagine, like whether it's supposed to be one dimensional, two dimensional or three dimensional. So I'll just play a little, a small film so to illustrate uh, how it works. So uh, if you want to make, for instance, uh, the sound from a, a wooden bar, you go to wood, and then you go up to the bar shape. You can uh, d decide the si size and then you get the sound. And then you can go down to the metal and have the same object but with a different material. You can change the size easily. And uh, yeah, the shape. A small glass. Yeah. So you see the idea, and uh, and so this this is very useful for several uh, uh, purposes actually. So uh, we've also used it uh, for uh, with a drummer Farid Meja who uh, who came and uh, and worked a bit with us with that. So with a uh, for for instance an electronic uh, drum set, uh, then you can uh, for instance uh, uh, map. Uh, the the force of the drumstick to the synthesizer so that if you play uh, softly then you get a, a wooden sound or you can evoke wood and then when he plays more strongly it evokes metal so uh, you see a part of it here And then um, we also developed some drumsticks that could be used uh, with a Bluetooth connection so that he could uh, control the, the, the sound f uh, at the distance just by knocking on anything. So this is a, a short film from CMMR uh, 2012 in London. It was organized by Mathieu Barthé. And so here he's... <laughs> Yeah. 
So a lot of things you can do with that. And so, uh, as I said, uh, we suppose that uh, uh, the, we can um, separate the action and the object, which is not true, of course, from a physical point of view, because when you act on something, the object will also respond. But from a perceptual point of view, it worked quite well. So this means that you can kind of simulate uh, the action and the object independently and mix uh, uh, in your own way, uh, actions and objects. So you, you can make kind of realistic uh, mixings, like uh, uh, rubbing a plate, for instance. There's nothing very particular about that. But you could also, for instance, rub the wind. Or any texture that you would like. Or you can maybe uh, make some bouncing water. This is a water drop. So what is interesting compared to uh, cross synthesis that you might have practiced already is that you, you, you really keep uh, the action and the object. You, you both recognize very well the, the object, the, the water and the, the action, the, the, what, what it does. So, so this is because it's so uh, perceptually uh, uh, oriented. So, so this is a, um, an interesting way of uh, playing with sounds. So, um, since uh, yeah, so so we we had the student who added the action object here. So, so this is uh, another uh, example of the synthesis size that I showed you uh, previously. So, with the material shape here, and now we add action. So we can go to continuously from different actions, and uh, this can be controlled by a graphic tablet, as you see here. This was a uh, work done by uh, Simon Conan, who was also um, a PhD student. So now he's rubbing plastic, and now he has something that rolls. And another thing that is interesting with this is that um, it can be also also be used, for instance, in in video games, because uh, with a synthesizer you can actually use uh, uh, a synthesized image to control the sounds. So this is what we did here with the Unity. We um, we uh, uh, let the image control directly the the sounds. So it's more a more realistic way of. Uh, of uh, having sounds in video games than, than just pre-recorded uh, sounds which are mainly used now. So you can, you can sh change the shape of the, the object and then uh, according to the, whether it's a cube or a sphere, uh, so it's the image that tells uh, the synthesizer what to play. And uh, uh, maybe it's a bit long, but uh, uh, this is uh, these squeaking sounds. So, of course, you can morph the materials. So, uh, when the ball is rolling on wood, it's not the same. It can go continuously from wood to, um, to stone, and so on. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's quite nice. And, uh, and also, recently, we, we did some... Um, we, we did not only focus on the solid sounds, but we also did some simulation of liquid sounds. And so we have now uh, made a bigger synthesizer that combines solid and liquid sounds. So you can either <coughs> produce solid sounds or liquid sounds, or you can make some kind of hybrid situation between uh, solid and liquid. And this, um, this might be a bit strong. Uh, I don't know. I, I can just... Um, Decrease the volume a bit here. Yeah. 
I don't know if you hear it. Maybe I. No, this is it. No, you have the solid sounds. You can, for instance, make um. You can, for instance, uh, have a metal plate, and then you can have a water that is falling and falling on the metallic plate. So you would hear both the water and the metal. And then, if you go up to the hybrid state, then you can kind of transform the water drops into metallic water drops. So this is metallic rain. Yeah, somehow. Well, it's, you know, you, you cannot contest because you've never heard it before. So, <laughs> I'm right. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, um, now a couple of words about the spatial dimensions, because now I, I've only been talking about isolated sounds. But now, in um, the last years, we have also become very interested in what to do with the space and how to add space to the, our sounds that we construct. And so we bought an eigen mic. You might have one as well here. No? <laughs> okay, so it's um, a microphone with 32 uh, um, mics uh, on it, and it, it's uh, made to, to, to do special recordings. And, uh, and so when you do recordings with the Icon mic, then you can bring it back to the lab. So we have a geodesic sphere uh, with loudspeakers on it, and so we can recreate the space as if uh, we were in the room. And um, we, for instance, did a, a recording from the opera uh, rehearsal in Marseille, and so when you're in the middle of this, the sphere, you have the, the uh, chief uh, behind you in your neck and the orchestra in front of you. So you feel that the chief is like breathing in your neck and uh, shouting and, uh, and really complaining about how slow they are and so on. And, and it's very realistic, actually. And so first we did some, also some uh, human uh, movement science project with, uh, with this uh, sphere. Uh, where we wanted to test uh, whether human posture was influenced by uh, something that turns around you in the 3D space, you know. And uh, because from, from the visual domain, uh, they have discovered that a visual source that uh, goes, uh, 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 you know, in front of you and moves in front of you kind of uh, seemed to destabilize uh, the person who watches it. And we thought it would be the same with sound. But actually what we found was that uh, sound uh, that turn around you seemed to stabilize you. So this might be an interesting also thing to study more deeply to find out whether, uh, you know, this could be also used for uh, remediation, for instance, or, uh, yeah, well, who knows? It's, it's, um, it's an interesting experiment. He didn't manage to, to, to show it uh, systematically, so we have to do some more experience to, to, uh, to try to find out more about it. And so uh, uh, just some months ago, we started a new project and we were contacted by some uh, researchers that are architects in, uh, in Marseille. And uh, what they wanted to do was that, uh, to see whether there was um, a, a correlation between the acoustic signature of small chapels up in the Alps and, uh, and uh, the ge geometry and the shape of the cha chapels. So there has been a lot of... Uh, kind of physical modeling of uh, room acoustics, right? And uh, it's a pity that Krokstai is not here anymore. <laughs> but uh, it would have been nice to, to talk with him about this because um, although there, are a lot of, there is a lot of uh, acoustic uh, physical modeling, uh, there is not a lot of work on what we actually perceive and how we can qualify uh, the acoustic signature and, uh, and uh, how good we are. Is it only reverberation or is it also the d direct um, reverberation from the wall? Uh, is it only the, the, uh, the walls that are of importance, the, the way they are covered, the stones or not? Or is it also, uh, is it the more the volume? Or what, what, how, can we, how can we perceptually you know, uh, qualify um, the acoustic signature? So we are going to measure 20 chapels up in the Alps. Oh, <laughs> thank you so much. OK, thank you. <clears throat> it's still there, the voice. <laughs> and, and so we're going to walk around and, and do some uh, recording. So what we do is that we do a, a sweep recording. Maybe you've uh, heard about this in your course. And, and then we uh, take it back to the lab, and we correlate it with uh, a uh, musical piece or something. So, uh, and we ask subjects to, to uh, for, for the timing, we've done uh, a, a very 
a, a pre-test, perceptual test on uh, the acoustic, the differences, the perceived difference between chapels. But we have to do more of this. And so I think we, we are going to try to, to work on perceptual distances between chapels, uh, like we do in timbre studies. Uh, we're not sure about this yet, but uh, just to show, to, to let you hear some examples of, uh, uh, of some uh, different rooms. So this is the anechoic uh, chamber. So it's very dry. And so we have two different chapels here who are not that reverberant. This is quite reverberant. And this one, I don't know if you hear the difference. The last one, was, which is extremely reverberant. So, um, it, it, there are many, many things that are difficult to evaluate here because uh, if you, uh, if you um, uh, convolve the, the room acoustics with uh, a certain piece like this, you know, this piece has been interpreted in a specific room. And so we know that uh, uh, musicians, they adapt their interpretation according to the room. And so uh, we also have, we'll have to judge the naturalness of... Uh, of this situation when we, we do the, the perceptual evaluation. So it's not only about reverberation time, uh, what people perceive, the, the, the perceived dis differences and so on, but there are a lot of different questions to, to answer and also whether we should use you know, piano sounds or wh whether we should use only voice. Uh, some uh, musicologists who are specialists in medieval music, they say that, oh no, uh, modern instruments should not be be used and so on. So uh, I'm out of time. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, I guess so. So uh, I just wanted to show you uh, one more thing. Uh, this is about, um, uh, so I didn't have time to talk about multimodal perception, how uh, a sound perception is influenced by uh, vision and uh, haptics and so on. But uh, I just one uh, study that is, was very fascinating, uh, where we compared, we, we wanted to see how uh, sound could influence visual perception. And so we asked people to, to watch a screen with a visual point source that moved, uh, followed a circle uh, shape. And uh, I wanted to see whether they uh, perceived a circle, even if they heard a sound that evoke, evoked an elliptic shape. So you will understand everything from watching this film. So just... So just you see that, that yeah, you're supposed to try to imagine that you draw now, uh, synchronize your movement with what you see on the screen. So when people see the spot that turns, they generally see a circle. If we now add auditory accelerations that evoke an ellipse, elliptic figure. What do people perceive? <laughs> so it's nice to have an example where you really sound uh, 
is more important than, than vision or it, we, we generally see the opposite, you know, there's so much attention paid to vision and little to sound. So we always love these kind of examples where sound take over, you know, and uh, yeah. So uh, I think I should stop here because, uh, yeah, we should have time for some questions. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. And so we have online viewers saying hi, <coughs> Alessia and Igil. And Igil has a question for you. So we will ah. start today with the online viewers' questions. Okay. The question goes uh, Do the physical models of the synthesizer use real world metrics, centimeters, kilograms, etc.? Kilometers? Yeah. Oh, no, it's not a physical model, actually. It's based on signal um, modeling. So uh, we, the, it is physic, uh, physical inspired because when we uh, simulate the shapes, there are some modal structures that are important from a perceptual point of view. So when we have physical models, we can use them to, uh, uh, for, for the sound synthesis, but it's mainly based on uh, signal uh, modeling. So the synthesizer that I show was um, uh, based on uh, subtractive synthesis. So you have a very rich signal that comes in, and then you have uh, 200 filters that do the job and that uh, adjust the sound so that it's, it imitates actions or objects. But then there was something uh, I, I didn't get in, in the last part of the question, I think. If it uses kilometers? Yeah, real world metrics. Yeah, no, no. Sorry, it does uh, not. hello, from yeah. Oslo. Can you repeat the question since oh, we yeah. didn't hear it? Oh, okay. Yeah. So this question comes from online viewer again. Do the physical models of the synthesizer... We can't hear it, sorry. Oh, oh. okay. <laughs> you want to talk in my... <laughs> Hello. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which one now? Hello. Yes. Can you hear us well now? Okay. So third time, do the physical models of the synthesizer use real-world metrics such as centimeters, kilograms, etc.? Now it makes sense, right, for Oslo? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Should so, I repeat the answer, or is it okay? It's okay. Okay. And then we have Anne uh, Björken, who's uh, leading uh, uh, Oslo questions. Okay. Maybe Oslo, do you have questions? No, not at all. We can come back to Trondheim, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so Trondheim, any questions? Uh, yes. Hmm? Is there any plan to release the synthesizer? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> or just like, where, what's the progress? A mortal the question. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, we would very much like to, to release it. So as I, I said previously, that it's, um, it's very much, it's all the time under construction. And, and uh, we, we have all always thought that we, if we release it now, then uh, there are some upgradings that won't work. And we don't really have the technical assistance for the time being to, to also... Uh, uh, make sure that the maintenance is done because the engineer who mainly developed it, he, he worked for us for five years and then we did not have fundings to, to continue. And uh, so he, he is uh, in the area. So uh, we try now to convince him to make a standalone platform that we can freely distribute uh, for use for anyone. But we, there is another synthesizer that I did not present here which is a uh, synthesizing um, environmental sound, like the waves you heard in the beginning in the quiz. And, and this is actually, actually available uh, online. And it's called SPAD, S-P-A-D. And it's developed by, uh, during uh, the PhD thesis of Charles Véron. So this is something you might be interested in uh, trying to use because you can uh, simulate uh, waves, uh, rain, uh, wind, uh, footsteps and uh, and it's also a specialized uh, specialized um, um, synthesis. So you can uh, distribute the sounds on uh, uh, up to seven uh, loudspeakers. So it really is very interesting for making uh, soundscapes and and so on. So uh, for the time being, that is what we can distribute. But we, uh, of course, we have to do it. Uh, yeah, make it available. Yeah, so this is a plan and uh, <laughs> our hope. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, oh, SPAD. So, so it's called SPAD. And S P A D. And the, the and where it's, can you if get you, it? If you on Google, if you do, if you write SPAD and Charles Véron. Charles Véron. Véron. Okay. V E R R O N. Okay. 
then you'll find it okay. and you can download it Thank and you. you can try it play with it yeah yeah okay. any more questions uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for the talk. It was uh, very interesting to see how you could morph between these different um, materials. Yeah. Is that a linear interpolation from one characteristic to another, or what, what happens in the middle? Uh, yes, for the time being, it's, um, uh, it's mainly linear inter interpolation. Sometimes it doesn't work very well with a linear interpolation, because uh, what is uh, true in the physical world is not really always true in the uh, perceptual world. So, uh, uh, but the, um, uh, the material spaces here are just the linear interpolations between, and then it's mainly the damping that is modified. That's the main thing that changes. So uh, you, can, you can play with that, you know, if you take a white noise and you try to heavily damp it, then you would simulate uh, kind of something that evokes wood. And if you uh, damp it less radically, then it uh, will evoke metal more. So it's, it's really very much about damping. And we've seen it in, in several um, other studies and <coughs> with the car door studies, <coughs> the damping turned out to be very important. Oh, I think. <coughs> I'm sorry. So it, it should be. <coughs> <coughs> sorry. Yeah, so so this is um, an important factor. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Any <coughs> more questions? It's we are <coughs> running out of time. <coughs> yeah, okay. Cool. Uh, it's okay. Thank you. Uh, since there was a lot of talk about like materials and how they sound different, like uh, when you t when you when you were talking about the spatial spatial part of it as well, uh, is there a way to like? Um, like create some form of synthesis when it comes to uh, like simulating a room yeah. with the different materials and yeah. would you use like like um, <laughs> and how would you <coughs> synthesize it? Would you just use like a Sherolder reverb or would you use like a combination of this material? This um, I don't know. Like what kind of methods would would what? Yeah, that's a very very good question, and and that's what we would like to do now. We would like to to add some kind of uh, original. Um, um, specialization effects. And so for the time being, that's why we, if, from a perceptual point of view, we look for uh, what is important and what people pay attention to, to see how we can propose new controls for composers. We want to take into account the spatial aspect. And maybe, you know, uh, also, maybe it could be possible to propose a tool for composers to add the spatial dimension into their composition and maybe make their composition more robust also when it comes to where to perform because I guess it's a big problem for composers nowadays uh, that the, they perform in very different spaces and, and sometimes it's kind of uh, surprising. They have surpri very nice or bad surprises uh, uh, depending on where they, um, they present their work. So, so this is also a, a project that we would like to, to perform to, to try to propose tools that take into account these uh, spatial dimensions. But uh, we're not there yet. It's, it's a bit too early, yeah. <coughs> yeah, Oslo? <coughs> is, there <coughs> is there any? No? No. Are we good then? Let's thank again, Solvi, for a fantastic talk. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>